Take it away, Alan. Okay, can we can we sing a quick happy birthday to you, buddy? While we're recording. <laughs> Sweetest. <laughs> okay, that's that's what happened. <laughs> you can sing happy birthday to me through benchmarks. <laughs> that is your challenge for the day. Make it sparkle. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan, if you want to share a screen with pretty pictures on it. Yeah, I can. If, yeah. Uh, okay. I wasn't expecting to start with this, but sure. Why not? Let's do it. You proposed uh, it. I did. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm my own worst enemy. Uh, let's have a look. Share this screen. Okay. Cool. Let's try and move this thing out of the way a little bit. Okay. Uh, cool. Can you all see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I managed to get this up and running again. Um, it's just it was just due to some I, the server got restarted and there's a component of it that isn't uh, set up to automatically restart itself. So um, so unfortunately uh, there's there's been a lapse in collection of uh, benchmark statistics, uh, but we still have historical benchmarks to look at right now. So um, let's quickly take you through this. Uh, so this is the Grafana, this is like a, a dashboard where we see the results of these performance metrics that we've been running and collecting. Um, and as it's set up now, these uh, performance metrics get run on a nightly basis. Uh, the, uh, again, and what happens is the JS IPFS repo gets updated. So we get the new, um, new code every night. Uh, and then these performance metrics get uh, get done. It's quite daunting. We have quite a lot of um, tests that are here, but we can um, like filter them uh, filter them down to just the things that we care about um, uh, to make it a little less uh, less daunting and a little more easier to inspect. And then you can obviously you can change like, the the dates and times and stuff from standard kind of Grafana style things. Um, so what are we testing? We have this uh, big matrix that I made of the things that we'd like to test. Um, so they are like adding files, they are catting files and stuff like, uh, yeah, MFS things and pub sub things and tests in the browser. Um, but it's also, uh, it's also variations in like, DAG uh, strategy, uh, as well as like uh, variations in uh, guys. Can you? Uh, can you yeah, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, that's totally difficult. Uh, I've, I'm sat in the kitchen because it's really hot. Anyway, um, so yes, variations in like DAG strategy, in like the transport we're using, in the multiplexer that we're using. Um, and, and uh, whether you're using SecIO or not. Um, uh, so it's variations in that, but also variations in the types of nodes we're using and the number of nodes we're using. So we've got like uh, the idea of like a test that is just for one node. So like adding a file, uh, that's just a test for adding it to one particular node. So it's like zero to zero. Um, but then we have like zero to one is like from one node to another node and they are two JS nodes in this case. Um, and then we have like JS to go and then we have five JS nodes to one JS node. Um, and then we, so we've got this whole matrix of tests that we thought we'd like to see. The green apples are the ones that exist. The red apples are the ones that don't, rather obviously. And uh, we have like a whole bunch of tests that are not applicable, but, um, but yeah, so we have those, which is pretty cool. Um, next up, how do, we, how do we add a test? Uh, it's just a JavaScript file. Um, there, there is some other bits, but I believe we're going to be making sure that there is a way, a, a proper tutorial for doing this. But you essentially, you get a, a few peers, um, you get some randomly generated files to test with, and then you, um, you take the time, do the test, take the end time, and record the result. Uh, and that's just about it. What's kind of nice about this is that the any tests that you um, edit or, um, or add, um, when, you, when they get merged to master, the, the, there's tests that run on this repo that get run. And if they're successful, then it will actually be deployed to benchmarks.ipfs.io. And so your tests will automatically start running um, against uh, whenever nightly happens or um, 
or, or the other trigger, which we haven't talked about yet. What does this look like? Um, so infrastructure wise, this is kind of two, um, two nodes, a controller node, which is this, this chunk of stuff here. This is way more complicated than, than you need to really understand now. So I'll just take you through the, the bits that are kind of interesting is that there are two, two machines. One is the controller. So this is in charge of uh, receiving the fact that um, uh, uh, the benchmarks need to be run, uh, actually scheduling in, them in and getting them run and recording the results, putting the results on IPFS. Uh, and then we have a, a, another bare metal um, uh, machine which is responsible for actually running those benchmarks um, and then uh, once they are done it will use these uh, clinic tools that um, these are a bunch of tools that Neoform uh, the company who set up this um, this this um, these benchmarks um, have created to help us um, kind of deeply debug uh, node uh, and what happened during those benchmarks so that's kind of cool um, yes yeah. so the interesting part here is that there is a HTTP endpoint a trigger uh, and we have a on the machine there's like a nightly uh, cron job which every night will um, trigger the benchmark the controller to run the benchmarks there is also a uh, this, so this could, this doesn't exist, but um, the trigger can be used uh, by CI to uh, run the benchmarks for a particular commit. Um, and there's, there's a Swagger endpoint with the, the, end, the, the config for doing that. And it takes like a, um, a, an API key that you have to know about to be able to, to trigger them. So where were we? Yeah, right there. Okay, so um, these are some of the interesting things about the benchmarks we've got. So here, this is just an example of like, we are, um, the variation here is between uh, our Mplex Muxer and Speedy Muxer. Uh, and we can see here that, which is kind of interesting. So what's kind of cool about these benchmarks is like looking over the, the, t what the, the captured data that we have, they're all fairly, um, fairly level, there's no, big kind of performance hit that that's observable from these so that's kind of reassuring uh in, in some way i guess uh um uh but so that there's that that is the you know the big thing that we can we can look at with the uh, the benchmarks you know because we can see instantly if there is overnight some particular drop in performance for a particular test so either either we're doing okay or we don't have the right tests so, uh, so, so that's interesting. So this is just one of them. Uh, we're, 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 our variation here is between Mplex and Speedy, uh, and it looks like um, uh, Speedy is, no, wait, Mplex is performing ever so slightly better. Um, the, on the left-hand side, the, um, the y-axis is uh, time in milliseconds um, for this test to happen. Um, and, but, so that's just JS to JS. Um, what we can see on this one is we've got um, adding a file in, we're adding a uh, 64 meg file in, um, in Go and JS. I don't know how to get rid of this drop down. Uh, so we can see that Go is, is a little bit faster. Um, three, so that's like three seconds versus uh, two seconds, um, which is, which is kind of cool. And then like, you know, we can change, we have, the, we have different um, types of files, but the four megabyte files are a little bit closer together to 200 odd milliseconds uh, to, to add, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. Other ones, we've got a uh, different transport here, so TCP and WebSockets. Um, these are, these are, we can see here that, that you know, they're actually, there's not a lot in it. Um, they're pretty fast and it was kind of interesting that WebSockets seem to be a bit faster um, than, than TCP. All right. So the other, the final kind of interesting thing about the benchmarks is that we also have this um, this ability to use the clinic, which I talked about earlier in the um, in the infrastructure. This, these clinic tools. So what happens here is that once the benchmarks have been run, uh, these tools go over the um, the kind of uh, debug files or I think the detrace files or, or whatever's there uh, to kind of pick out the uh, interesting stuff and do and show us like flame graphs and things. So um, I need to look into why we don't have these for all of them. I don't know if they're meant to be there for all of the tests that we've ever done. Um, or, but I know that the Swagger endpoint for triggering them, you can tell it to uh, clinic enabled. You can uh, tell it to run clinic on, the, on this particular um, benchmark. So I don't, 
I need to figure that out. But like I said, uh, I've just I only just got this running. So, um, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I should just be able to click on this guy. Um, and so then we see all of the tests we have here. Um, and so for extracting, lo so this is local extract. This is like a file has been added to your node and this is the time it takes to cat it back out um, to you um, just locally. So this isn't involved in any kind of network, but we've got these uh, three things and we can pull up the flame graph for that. Uh, and then we get this nice uh, kind of visualization of um, what the node was doing uh, whilst that was happening. Um, and then we can you know, drill into the kind of hotspots of where um, yeah, things like that. Um, and that is just about all I know about it. Uh, and it needs, it needs a bit of work, but yeah. Can you give us like one shot quickly of like the benchmark homepage or something? Cause you showed a lot of really beautiful pages and I'm like, Hmm, I imagine logging in here. I'm going to be so confused about how I find those pretty pages that Alan showed me. So if there's like a so the, the, intro um, index, yeah, right. So when you first get there, you will um, you will arrive. If I let me just, you will arrive here. There's no data points because we last seven days there this wasn't running. But we can uh, change that. Ah, the video's in the way. Get out of the way. Uh, we can change that to last ninety days, and then we can see um, all of the data that was collected. And then just underneath that graph, let's just expand it here a little bit. Just underneath that graph, these are all the tests that exist. So these are all the lines on the graph. Um, and so you can click on one or more of these to just show this particular, um, these particular tests. Um, uh, and then, yeah, you can, you can like drag over a particular date period to zoom in on that date period. So if you see like there's a big drop of, um, in, in one of the graphs, it, compared to the others then you can drill in take a look at that um, but th there is really only this one page that is configurable um, to look at the, the results um, uh, but you can like things that I often do are like change the file set that was used to see if that had like different ca performance characteristics um, uh, but we also we also record CPU and memory as well as the duration of this um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, and yeah, you can filter by a particular um, commit in GitHub. Uh, but yeah, th there's, there's only one real page to it. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we can also probably, I don't know um, what getting access to this looks like, but would love to be able to like put some of the default graphs that we want to keep tracking over time um, kind of out by default. Otherwise, it takes like five mouse clicks to like mm -hmm. recheck each thing. Okay. You can, there is, uh, I think Hugo went in and, and built a different, you can create the graphs like this, it's like Grafana is just like this generic kind of tool for graphing things. So you can create um, different dashboards. Um, you just need to log in as an admin and, and it's, it's totally possible. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, other questions, Raoul? Yeah, that's, uh, th thanks a lot for that walkthrough. It was super useful because uh, I did have a look at the, at the benchmarks REPL and I could see kind of like the theoretical side of things. So it's, it's really, it's been, like we even got, it was great to see, you know, there is a bunch, a lot of alignment between, between what test infra, testing infra, the design that we're working on and what is or the, the moving components and the, the components that are present in this particular system. So it's like, at the end of the day, you know, when you're doing benchmarking, like, you know, most systems are gonna be concerned with the same concepts, they're gonna be concerned with the same domain, right? So it's good just to get that confirmation. Uh, I think Molly, um, what you said in like, basically, hey, uh, getting access, like we don't wanna have a myriad tools out there that we need to check one by one to get a sense of how things are performing across the board. Ideally, we'll be having a single dashboard which provides a unified entry point and experience to uh, the engineer and with the architecture that we conceptualize for, uh, for the testing pipeline, running this, so this has a front end and it has a back end, right? So what, what um, what Alan showed us, uh, the the architecture diagram with with a coordinator or I can't remember what you called it in the in like that 
components in the middle and then the minions, this is kind of like the backend and it's powered, it is driven by an API. So potentially we could integrate this testing infrastructure into the testing, the wider testing pipeline for IPFS, such that whenever we detect a commit in JS IPFS, we could be the ones like triggering, calling the API uh, via a particular encapsulating like all of these calls and wrapping, you know, the, the spawning of this job in the in this infrastructure uh, under a test runner because we have the concept or we're building the concept of of pluggable test runners out of which you know canary testing is one is is one strategy for testing IPFS code but the JS IPFS benchmarks could be another test runner so potentially we would be triggering the job and then. The test runner has an input and it produces an output where the outputs are basically a bunch of metrics. And th those metrics are in a particular data model such that what we could do is pick them up from Grafana, if sorry, from Prometheus, if they're being posted there, or I can't remember, InfluxDB, I think it is, if they're being posted there, and then you know, bring them, import them into the unified uh, metrics database of the testing pipeline. So that, that you know, is effectively one way of integrating um, this piece into the pipeline because this is you know what, what we're building or we're setting out to build is really a pi like it's the unified view of the pipeline the hey something happens a, a change happened in the IBFS code base it could be Go or IBFS uh, sorry it could be Go or JS um, and we want to see how things are interoperating performing where the basic smoke tests are running, how they're performing against the, the live net, how they're performing in private, you know, in private networks with a particular composition, uh, a composition mimicking the public network. So, you know, a bunch of things. Yeah. Does that make sense? Steven has a question. Uh, well, quick question about Grafana. Can you, uh, so I see this, this table of like times for each run in the XS file uploads. Uh, is it possible to get like a, a, a table of like, here are all of the, uh, I don't know if it's possible, like here are all of the different metrics we have and then a bunch of time runs and then like cells with like the individual stats we have from them. Uh, something where like I can easily like, browse through all the benchmarks. Because my concern here is like, just like uh, trying to like find, oh, like here's this benchmark, here are all the properties associated with this benchmark at this time or across these times. Uh, it's a bit hard to dig into that. I just don't, I don't know if I go on to know if that's easily doable. Yeah, I, um, I do not know, but I can probably find out. I'm not, um, I don't know a lot about Grafana. I only, I only started using it when, um, when this was built. I spent like, a while trying to play around with this for the, um, the other Grafana dashboards because I was trying to get useful like um, metric deltas and stuff like that and do like changes over time and aggregate. And it was extremely difficult and I had to export it to a CSV, but I might also be a noob, so. Well, one thing I like about this is like we can actually change this without having to go and change the backend. Uh, where like with the current setup that we're proposing, like we'd have a fixed uh, UI, which like, yes, we can have graphs on it, but like we're not going to get this wonderful interactive like query system that we have here. Uh, and I, I think this may actually like just give us everything we need almost out of the box. It turns out Grafana also has support for buttons. Uh, like we can inject arbitrary HTML. Uh, so we could do that for even like triggering tests um, or like uh, linking to various things. Uh, so I think this is pretty, like, I, that's why like, I want to look at and see like, what, basically how can we integrate our system into this? Do you duplicate as much work as possible and then make it interactive as possible? But, yeah, roll, sorry. Yeah, so I think Grafana is a great tool to drill down. Uh, but when you require that top level view, bird's eye view, uh, we definitely need a UI that we own that is designed for exactly digesting the pieces of information that we need to display in a comparative fashion. Um, so, like, and I definitely see, you know, uh, lots of links in that particular dashboard that would send you off to a particular Grafana instance, maybe with a slice of time or a view preselected or whatever that allows you to like zero in to a particular event that, you know, has happened um, from this, like, top-level digest view. I, I wonder if we can just make that dashboard here. It looks like we can. Uh, I'm just not entirely sure. Because, um, like, we already have this dashboard of, like, simple times. 
Uh, now what we want is like a, uh, some kind of dashboard that, well, so the thing we're missing here is like the yes or no, like the did this uh, run faster than the cutoff or slower than the cutoff? If it, like, yes, it's gonna, it's, yeah, I know it's, it's gonna be super tricky, I think, to model this with Grafana because at the end of the day, we do wanna pick, be able to pick for a particular baseline that we wanna uh, compare, you know, specific metrics against. And Grafana is really good to show to show time series, you know, a, a series of time time of data points over time. But like, I don't think I might be able to hack it. But that's I think that's actually pretty similar. Cause like, what we'll probably have is like one row per benchmark, uh, and then each like each column will be uh, one run of each benchmark. And for that, we can just like have like graphs going across the screen, uh, one for each benchmark. Uh, with like at each point we'd have the different uh, things that happen and we could use uh, bar graphs so we could clearly see like this is this run this is this run and we can uh, zoom in on the time so that's why i'm thinking like the, the nice thing about this is we get this nice ui where we can just mess with things ourselves or like anything we build will give you the overview but if you want to mess with it you'll have to jump into grafana i'm concerned like that will take extra effort or like if we have it all grafana already then it's just like there but I think we're um, starting to cut our bike shed a little bit. Um, so I want to get us back on topic of the, the overall yeah. thing of this mission. Thank you, Alan, so much for presenting. I think, I think Hugo had a hand too. Okay. Did, did Hugo? Request for our hands to be important hands. Continue. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I think uh, we can model um, like high level dashboards pretty well in Grafana. It all depends on the backend database. If you can do the query that we need, you can model it uh, in uh, in Grafana. So it all depends where you save the data. Just that. Yeah, just just one final remark there. Um, Grafana is great for contiguous time slices, uh, but when you have multiple branches that are evolving independently, and you want to test one, like you want to compare one against the other, and you know there's no like. It, there are different timelines that are happening in parallel that would be very difficult to model in Grafana from, from my experience with Grafana. Um, but this might be, you know, uh, might have changed. We market. can tag each one of these with like master or whatever branch it's on. Uh, and then like the, the graphs can show master or nightly or whatever. Uh, and then like we can have like a separate list of like runs. Uh, well, actually, I, I think this is important to discuss. Like this is basically scoping the work. Uh, so I want to like, come decisions like are we going to just use grafana or are we going to like build up another system on top of it uh, are we going to reuse the same databases that javascript is using right here or the i guess that fs team is using or are we going to uh like build up a new like system like which we want to which we want to replace uh but this that's what i'm trying to get um yeah so uh that leads leads nicely into i think a meta point uh, of how to think about these things. Um, a, a key point here, given that we have really problem-focused groups that need to be able to sprint forward on specific tasks that are blocking each of these, these different projects, is to try and remove cross-dependencies where possible. Um, so if, if there is a, um, a thing that is going to block this team's progress and um, is otherwise like critical for the next stages of development, having an MVP of, of that stage that has zero blocking dependencies on other groups is super important. Otherwise, we're gonna end up inevitably in the place where one group is blocking the other, has more important things on their plate than unblocking the other group, and we're sitting around spinning our wheels because one group can't get to the other thing. Now, an MVP doesn't mean that we don't eventually want these things all to end up in the same place, and I think we do, um, but that could be like, you know, one website that has three different web UIs that, you know, boom, 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 hit these same things. And by the way, we embed them all into like one master page so you can like really easily click between them. And like, that's a fine world to live in um, as long as we're making it really accessible and not adding like dev overhead for checking the, this like, what now looks like the same page, but initially was built as three separate UIs when we, when we first started out to remove this cross dependency across groups. And so, that's the method. I think that is significantly more important than reducing um, like overlap. Um, if we have some amount of overlap that we can later kind of reuse, um, 
that's okay as long as we end up using our time really wisely now in terms of getting to a place. So that's that's like my meta point for how we make these decisions. Stephen? The, 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 the kind of point is it would be nice to reduce time and effort in building a new system. It's like I don't want to build a second dashboard if we already have something we can just use. Uh, yeah, um, and like if we are, because we already have the test orchestrator here that appears to do a lot of what we need to do. Uh, like, and this is all done, so it's not like we're waiting on anyone else. So my, my thinking is like, if we can just like open this up to the testing team and then just start building on what's there, it may be faster. Now it may be slower because like, it's already like, we aren't familiar with it, in which case we should pivot. But my point is like, maybe let's reuse stuff. Uh, Jim, you have thoughts on that. Um. The information I'm sort of missing is there's all these different projects and I don't really know why they came about, why they died, like why were, was a new project started when there was a previous project, like was it unsuitable? Um, so I, I think that's like good information to have when we build yet another one um, to avoid the same traps. Uh, but I think a lot of it's just per perhaps staff turnover or just not even staff turnover, but people going from one project to another. Um, is that a fair assessment, I guess? Uh, just a, a note, I think this one is a victim of the GoJS divide, um, which hopefully will finally die. Hands, hands on this particular topic. Raul is yours. Yeah. Well, then so there's, uh, there's really like two series just to uh, give you a little bit of history there. And I'm, I, and I'm, I joined the company one year ago and many of these efforts predate my joining the company, but I do have um, my, like a view. Uh, basically, this like the vision of creating, you know, a test lab that people can, it, it has morphed a long time. Uh, initially, we wanted like I, um, the IBFS project wanted, like the grand vision is, to create a dynamic system that is public where people can plug in compute power essentially and an infrastructure and a node anywhere around the world that could then be used to run a series of tests uh, across a decentralized network, right? This is like one vision. Then there have been other visions which are a bit more constrained and more like with, with a tight view on applicability in the sense that <laughs> what we want to test is IPFS and lippy to and we want to test it in like hermetic, you know, tight, airtight deployments such that we can characterize how our code is working in a predictable and reproducible environment, right? And this has been like the sort of like the underlying necessity that led to, for example, the current test lab effort that, that code has been needed, right? And then there is, for example, benchmark, the, the JS benchmarks, the way that I see it, that the way that I see it is like a particularly as, as Steven said, that are like a very scoped effort uh, to characterize JS releases, right? And potentially over in the future, compare them with, with Go releases. So things like think of this as, as kind of like, first of all, a bunch of visions which have made, you know, uh, which have iterated over time and also, you know, created like various efforts a long time. But then also think of this as like a microservice oriented <laughs> organization, right? People just build the tools that they need for the time that they need them. So this is, for example, the way that I see that the JS benchmarks actually came to life. I don't, but I, I don't know what the, like the actual history was, but I can see, you know, this is the application. Alan, you are next. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that like these particular benchmarks were um, they didn't really die they it's probably been nearly a month since they I, they have been off but we've still got that historic data the, the problem was just that it's, the machine was restarted and something didn't come back up um, when it was when it came back on so um, like this particular project didn't die there is a previous JS benchmarks that this project took inspiration from but wasn't based on it because it was it was based in the web browser and we wanted to be able to um, to run go nodes as well as um, as js nodes so that we could compare between the two implementations so uh, like Raul was saying this has been um, a kind of iteration on on an idea for for a while um, the other thing I just wanted to really quickly say was like um, grafana is um, is like one of those um, applications that you can kind of do anything with and when I was asking about it when this was being worked on the guys were like 
yeah, what, basically whatever you want to do, we, we can do. It might not be pretty, but it can be done with Grafana. Um, but it is a bit clunky and it doesn't give you that nice overall um, uh, overall view that um, that I think you're talking about, Raul. But um, the, um, it can be created in a way, and I think that's what Hugo was trying to do initially with with a um, with the dashboard that I was uh, that I quickly um, demonstrated. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all I needed to say. Um, but oh, actually, one more thing. Sorry, really quickly. Um, the thing that this doesn't have um, that we would need if if it's like ninety percent there, then that's great. But the one thing that this doesn't have is um, like it's taking JSIBFS nightly and updating JSIBFS and using that particular version uh, in the tests. It's not doing so. What we'd have to do is um, change it so that it took Go nightly and built that and used that in the tests as well. So that's that's the delta there. So I just, uh, th thanks a lot for that. I just shared uh, my screen. This is a mock-up that Jim came up with. It is a, a starting point for kind of like what we were conceptualizing as what could turn into that potential top-down view um, that, that gives us kind of like, you know, the bird's eye view of the different types of uh, test plans that are being run, uh, the test cases, and the metrics that we've registered, for example, these metrics, like they could be time, they could be bytes in, bytes out, and so on, as well as links to binaries and profiles and heap dumps and so on that, you know, would uh, would be the raw material that, for example, Clinic is, is analyzing here for you guys. Uh, and behind uh, the posting of the profiles and the, um, the dumps and so on, we could, uh, the, the, testing the testing pipeline could also be performing intelligence to extract, you know, metrics of interest out of those uh, profile dumps and post them here as well. So kind of like, you know, uh, we want this to be, this, is kind of, this would be kind of like the, the, um, the view that we've been conceptualizing. It is very like this, this comes from, from inspiration as well from Juan and a few references that, that he gave us uh, at the beginning. Um, to, you know, for example, if you look at the, at the Chrome benchmark tests, if you look at the node.green, no for example, that kind of like matrix view would be kind of like the main source of inspiration, right? We want a matrix where we can see greens, uh, yellows, and reds, and it becomes immediately obvious, you know, where we should be putting our attention to uh, without having to parse a chart, right? Uh, when, you, when you parse a chart, like I could imagine, um, sorry, I could, uh, I could imagine, like, if, 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 you, if you model this in Grafana, then it's probably going to be looking like a huge, either a huge chart with a lot of lines, so you, information is going to get lost, right? Or it's going to look like a dashboard where you have to scroll a lot up and down, right? So I'm, I'm not, like, 100% sold um, on whether Grafana would be the right top-level view. Um, and I think we need to own that view because it needs to, like, I want this place to be the, you know, the point where any IPFS member, community member, not necessarily engineers, but any community member can just, you know, access and see the health of each and every single commit on Go in JS in the sense that how is this performing against the public network? How is this performing in a scenario with 1,000 nodes or whatever? How is this performing against another implementation, uh, how they interoperating, a bunch of smoke tests. Uh, if we deploy a particular release in like a soft release in a gateway or a bootstrapper, what are the metrics, right, uh, that we're capturing? Is it looking better or worse than yesterday? Like, you know, this unified view uh, that is intelligible from as soon as you, as you go in, as intelligible as node.green is, for example, right? Which is, you know, you just get it. Uh, as soon as you go in. Um, so I'd like to just um, confuse things even further. Um, I've been experimenting with uh, uh, um, scientific notebooks like Jupyter um, for sort of like one-off experimentation. And uh, I don't like, that's not a dashboard obviously, but I would like, like if I, if I did a, a scientific notebook exploration, I want to publish that somewhere where it's visible. So I like that to be linked from a dashboard. So I, I don't really know um, 
how that will work, but um, I, I hopefully have some prototypes in the next few months. Um, I want to continue my effort to bring these topics meta to give us like general guiding principles about how we do this, because I think in many cases that's going to be more important than like specific decisions. Um, I think Stephen's point from before that like this has a lot of what we need already, which is awesome. And like, let's, let's start playing around with the benchmark data we have and use this as a place where we can push stuff and try and pull it from different directions and see where this doesn't meet our needs. We're going to get a lot of feedback um, just by getting things there, trying to sink our teeth into it and understanding where Grafana like doesn't let us go the direction we want to go. Having done that like a while with our other metrics, like we will find points where it's like, oh, I really want to be able to do this thing and Grafana doesn't let me. Um, or the shape of the data behind Grafana isn't letting me or something like that. Um, but this exists and it runs nightly and you can add benchmarks to it by like adding pull requests somewhere and that's great. Um, and so let's try and make use of that and not try and invent a new system to start doing that. That being said, um, principle of not blocking endeavors across each other, like I see a lot of value in this node green style thing. I also agree with making it accessible, but to the extent that we can have an MVP milestone of like, hey, let's start by just pushing these things to the place that already exists. And hey, cool, we can also be working on, on this pathway at the same time where we like, shoop, take, take our data and like um, take it from there into other pathways. And hey, but at the same time, we're gonna grab all of this other data that already exists and also put that into improved UIs or things like that. Um, I think my, my, my meta point here is let's try and, and cut our deliverables down to the extent that we can get something up and running as quickly as possible so that we can learn from it. Um, and to let's make sure that um, we, don't, we don't block these efforts across each other such that um, you know, it's like, great, I can get this thing up, but I also want to do this other thing because in this area for this slice of testing, it's going to be really, really critical, but no other team is dependent on me doing that to start adding their own things to something that already exists. Um, so I guess my, my meta proposal there is like, this seems really awesome. Let's start playing around with it and using it. Like for one, I would love to go play around with the test visualizations because to make it more accessible, because let's imagine this is the thing that we are using for test visualizations for at least the next month. We probably want some better things there, but a month from now, maybe we have a better system that we can also import this data into. I think that'd be grand. Um, and we probably have value adds for both. Um, so that's, that's my meta point. And I do want us to like get back to the, the list of tests at some point if others, yeah, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good idea. I can I can put a minimal amount of effort into this to make it more useful for Go IPFS, and in the meantime, collect the pain from everyone else, and in, use that to inform other efforts that are, that are going on, and, and um, I, that that will get us somewhere, and then we can iterate and. Um, yeah. Uh, from Go side, the most useful things would be able to uh, run a Go test or a Go benchmark. Um, so either like helper functions or just an example where like you're calling a sort of program. And then two, uh, some example where like you're, you're extracting more information, just like time runs, like bandwidth, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I like, can somehow dump that somewhere. Uh, that would be awesome if you have time. Yeah. Um, I was looking at the, the, the machinery that runs in there. It would be totally possible to just run that stuff with Cole's test lab inside the test lab environment if we want to scale up because i think it's only like maximum five nodes right now so it's like we want to try bigger things and do that across the cluster it, it was designed um, it was never designed to be like a thousand thousand node test yeah thing. it was like we'll like, do five and yeah then we'll see where we get like, to. Cold test lab just runs linux inside it right you can just if it runs on linux you can run it in there so Cool. Um, yeah, so it sounds like we have some next steps on this thing in particular now that it exists again. Thank you very much, Alan, and that the test infra people have looked at it and think there is some opportunity for um, like in a, a stage two, uh, like overlap and, and accessibility merging, um, but we're not going to block on 
um, having these things be the same thing. Um, I think Stephen's point and something to kind of evaluate role is like, if, if there is work that already exists, is already done here that you can steal to hit an MVP really fast, that would be great. Um, if it doesn't, then say lovey, but that'd be super cool. Even as like a system that helps us unblock Go IPFS releases a month earlier would be very much appreciated. Um, all right, to go back through the document that Stephen created yesterday, there's a whole ton of stuff in here, um, which is great. It's an awesome census. Um, I think looking at this and how, um, how we want to move through it, I feel like there's some of these things which are, yeah, I think I, I'd prefer if we start with like um, desired testing coverage or anything that's confusing to people or has questions with people because there's a lot of stuff in here like, you know, integration benchmarks or inter interrupt tests or things like that where I don't feel like we need to discuss it. It's very good it's written down, but there aren't like top level questions or um, interfacing cues about it. And so I'm imagining this more from like, you know, things where we actually think there's going to be tactically work done this quarter um, and just making sure we don't step on each other's toes with that work. So I think there's some low hanging fruit in terms of just actual test cases. Um, I was playing around with my little three, three peer in um, test, test lab simulation and playing around with BitSwap. And I could just tell between three peers that like BitSwap was doing some bad things. So I think that would be an obvious one to focus on. I think you could get like a good, like two or, or 20, 30% speed up would be reasonable to expect to be able to see like the graphs move if we fix some of the issues. The problem is I think it's like, it doesn't behave the same every time you run it, and um, there's some ra random things happening. So, how do we do? We just run it over and over and over again and average the numbers. I think Rolls think thought a lot about this. Uh, yeah, this is. I think this is uh, this is something we need to go through uh, synchronously because uh, there's. A lot of brainstorming to do here in general. It is the first time that we're getting kind of like a process, like a census of what's available uh, across code bases, across tooling, across, you know, like all the venues uh, in the same place. Uh, and also doing the brainstorming of what kind of tests uh, we want in the same place as, you know, that's listing what tools we already have. So I think we're just going to have to go through this asynchronously. Um, and I suggest that we set a date for everybody to make sure that it gets, you know, that everybody gets to contribute the kind of tests that they think should happen. Um, and, and yeah, there's, there's a deadline for that to force it. So maybe end of this week. Could you read to this document? To finish this document and consider a version one of this document I, as the thing that you know is going to be our north north star north star in terms of where we want to get to. I think that involves some amount of massaging of the format of this document. As of right now, I I think it's a very good census, but I don't think it is a. Um, prioritized list or roadmap. So like there's stuff on here that are that are like wish list items that we're not going to get to this quarter that are really useful to be tracking and important that we've written down, but like you know, aren't going to end up on any team's task list because we have very large items that we really need to get to that are super high priority. Um, and so I think massaging from from this list into like actually what is being taken on and by which groups um, like that is that is the really useful part. And so I'd actually maybe kind of like to, like uh, I feel like there was a, um, a thread in our all hands last Thursday, which was kind of identifying, hey, wait, there's like some, maybe not disconnects, but like there is um, lack of clarity in what other groups need and are doing in order to be successful. And people want to be aware of that because, um, you know, 
There might be like work slated for a later milestone, which is going to get ton done by another team. But if you don't know it, you can't reuse it um, or take advantage of it. And so th that's like the level of like, these are the things that this group is doing from a testing perspective and making that visible to all of the other groups is really useful. Otherwise, um, everyone continues off on like their own separate threads and isn't going to get exposed until a later point that's, you know, hey, wait, we've been doing duplicate work. Yeah, so I think in terms of scope of what this particular group is, has set out to focus on, that was uh, defined in the OKR. So that was uh, production canary testing and uh, different levels of priority, uh, private network testing. Uh, but having said that, this group is building test infra for all of IBFS. And this is, you know, where I wanted to gather requirements from all of IBFS, right? Because we can't build an infrastructure that potentially evolves to work for everybody if we don't have this place where we collect what everybody actually needs, right? Uh, so this is like, I think the scope, at least from my point of view, the scope for testing infra, unless you know you want to push back on it or you think we should be focusing on other things. Uh, I think the, um, the focus for test infra in this quarter is sort of like sealed in the OKRs that I presented a few weeks ago. And I think it should be, it should be clear what this group is going to be working on. Uh, if you think that is not the case, then uh, let's talk about it. I wonder if it would make sense to put like the, the IPFS benchmarks project under the infra test umbrella, just to clarify. Like we're, we're trying to decide, decide on interfaces here. And so it's like having um, like Alan in Steven's group running this benchmark system and then uh, Raul and me building, and Cole building another system. And um, organizationally, it seems a little odd. I think my caveat to that, and my caveat to, to Raul's point, is I think from my view, and let's, let, you guys can maybe debug my thinking. From my view, there's three efforts here. There's um, the test infra project, which is building test infra and uh, making sure that that exists. There is um, the kind of the, the two like project operations and package manager teams, which are writing the benchmarks that they care about to make sure that the thing that they need tested in order to unblock their work forward and to regularly get feedback loops that they care about in order to do the development work that they need are, are written and then get run somewhere. Um, I think this thing that exists is a very good somewhere to start with because it exists and that's great. And you can just start running the benchmarks. So I think this should be our default. This is where we stick the thing once it exists. And if you then take that thing and put it inside test infra, wondrous, um, and give us like even more magical things on top of it. But I want to unblock like Steven Allen, folks on the package managers team under Andrew, like those humans from like writing the benchmarks they care about. One, I don't think that the two of you have enough bandwidth to write all of those benchmarks. I don't think that we want the testing infra team to be like responsible for all benchmark writing across the project. I think that's a giant load of work and you're not gonna be the best tuned to do it. Um, and so there is like tactical, like these are the benchmarks we need that I think needs to happen on other teams and needs to be unblocked to, to like, start getting progress because you'll write a benchmark, you'll run it, you'll realize you actually need a tuned version of that benchmark and you want to be able to iterate without being blocked for, you know, on a new system being created. Um, and then there's the, the gateway work that Hector's working on, which is like, hey, we should have nightly mirrors. Hey, we should have like gateway canaries. Um, again, like part of testing, part of validating that IPFS is performing as expected, um, but it's like spinning up gateway nodes and and running gateway infrastructure in such a way that we can do it, which also seems um, from a infra configuration and like knowing the metrics we care about for the gateway, something that the gateway team is best, best suited to do. Um, and again, if that gets consumed and put into a, a test infrastructure in a centralized place, wonderful, but I don't, their first milestone shouldn't require testing infra being done or require the testing infra team to do something in order that they can start getting value from that and using that to iterate on um, on gateway production readiness and such. So that's my understanding of the lay of the world. Jim had a hand, Roel has a hand. Yes. Let I me know if I got it wrong. Cut these things in half and there's a top half and the bottom half. The bottom half is infra, top half is tests. And it's like infra team work or test infra works on infra half. Test is 
developers. If that's a good way to think about it. So let me, uh, I, I think I see your point, but I was thinking of like a different paradigm and a mental model here. Um, like I think of this as, um, like think of an organization, an enterprise that is building microservices, right? Or we've got, and you know, a somewhat Conway's law, what we're seeing here, people are building, you know, the software that they need uh, to be able to fulfill, you know, their goals uh, and to fulfill the goals of their group. So really what we want to do at this point, since we are kind of like from this, and this is, like my view, um, since we are kind of like a horizontal effort that is enabling a unified view of the testing that's happening on top of IPFS, what we want to do is at this point, start engaging with Andrew's group, with package managers, and start engaging with testing infra without, you know, just to have conversations, not to block, not to block our efforts because we really don't want to block our efforts, but we want to inform our design at this point, right? And I think this is the key. Like we're not going to be defining contracts, interfaces, nothing like that, but we want to understand how you guys are building those, those, those tests, particularly in the package managers, because I've seen you already have progress on this. So it would be cool to know how, you, how you're building them and how we can make it easy for you at this point, since we are conceptualizing the design, to integrate those tests, right? Once we are, once we have the menu for that, once we have the container, how do we, like, what does that container need to look like for them to be able to run their tests? And in terms of, um, in terms of gateway, it's got like the, the same thing. I, what I see is that this, the testing pipeline is going to be the orchestrator, right? So at one point, we'll have a commit, and it's going to be a nightly, and it's going to be a schedule, is going to trigger a job somewhere in infra that is going to deploy one specific commit to infra with a specific lifetime, which is going to be 48 hours, whatever we want it to be. And when that probe has finished, right, we pull in all the metrics and we display them in the dashboard, right? Or we do this on a continuous basis. So, I mean, I think we have, as, as you say, Molly, you identify we have two surfaces. We should already start engaging in conversations so that we're building, so that the horizontal platform we're building can accommodate all of this. Um, and we take this into account in the design without blocking on this, right? So uh, how, what do you feel, like how do you feel about this? I think design conversations to inform mm -hmm. future iterations seems really good. In those cases, like probably Alan, Stephen, Andrew or whoever else in the package manager's team is going to kind of run forward with benchmarking are like great people to interview from a here are our needs and use cases, probably Hugo as well as someone who is like creating and writing benchmarks in this tool already. Um, and that kind of the two of you doing that interviewing in order to inform the design work makes a lot of sense, but that um, using tactically the existing baseline infrastructure that's already running is going to make it so that these groups can progress without blocking on you guys. And um, even better for them, they're not gonna invest, I don't think at this point, a lot of time in creating like UIs and fancier orchestrators and things like that with the assumption that this baseline that we have is good enough for our use cases right now. It sounds like it can do all of the things we want for the benchmarks we know um, about though TBD, whether Grafana is going to let us do it quite as easily as we want, and that that's already going to be in a format that you can like, great, cool. And now it also exists in this wonderful unified testing pipeline, um, which saves work on blocks dependencies, which hits both of my two goals for these efforts. Hmm. No, there are always iframes. There are always iframes. <laughs> yes, iframes <laughs> all the way down. Yeah. So uh, then just to clarify, um, like these two sort of like strands of work, um, the using and adapting and adopting JS benchmarks for these, for the use cases that we want to, that we want to run and trying to like advocate for JS benchmarks to like cover the minimal um, thing that will allow us to, to unblock IPFS, go IPFS releases now. Uh, who's going to be leading this particular effort? Like this looking, is, is this Alan? Uh, do you have the bandwidth or uh, is it going to be Jim? I, I wouldn't like to think about this as JS benchmarks, they're just benchmarks. Uh, they just happen to be uh, run with a JS test suite. Um, I mean, I, I on my plate, I'm planning on just like adding a bunch of benchmarks and I think Alan was doing the same thing. But 
Sorry, can't speak right. Colin? Yeah, I, uh, so the takeaway that I had from this meeting was that I would spend some time making this less JS focused and more Go, fo not more Go focused, but bring them up to the same level um, so that it, it's not something just for JS. Um, I might need some help with that, but um, yeah, I, like I don't have a lot of time um, to do that and even less so this particular period. I have a baby coming soon that uh, will I'm going on paternity leave, but so um, <laughs> that that takes up a chunk of my time as well. Uh, so I will do what I can. Um, uh, but like I said, like it, it, there may it might be a really small delta to getting this useful for Go as well. Um, and I'd like yeah, to, if you could get like the delta, to just like be make it easy to run a Go test, then I can make all the tests that actually happen because we already have a bunch in the Go repos that I can just run, uh, and they can actually run against JS as well. So. Um, so the, I was looking at also at the, the Kubernetes IPFS repo, which also has a whole bunch of test suites. And they wrote their test suites in a, a DSL, which is YAML based, uh, which, I mean, if you do something like that, it doesn't matter if it's JS or Go, because you're not writing in either of those. I wonder, I don't know if any of that's worth reusing, but like, um, like that approach, like I know Roll was talking about coming up with a bit of a DSL just to make it easier to write these tests uh, at a higher so, level. Uh, so for deployments, I think that makes sense. In terms of like the test suites, most of our tests are actually puppeted by APIs anyways, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's like if we, if we have like our the clients just like talking to either the Go server or the, the JS server, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so I'm imagining some of the package manager tests will be shell scripts because they'll have set up uh, and Possibly some importing of real-world data. Um, we could write them in Go, but shell scripts feel a little bit more kind of portable, maybe slightly longer living, uh, or at least more people will be able to pick them up and use them. But I don't think it matters too much. Yeah, the test environment is going to be Linux, so JS can call Go, Go can call JS. You know, JS uh, can call shell script, Go can call shell script. So. Andrew, does the the JS benchmarking dashboard that Alan showed at the beginning does that vaguely meet package manager needs at least to kind of unblock iteration of of running these things like the architecture and um, kind of the feedback loop there? Yeah, the ability to run them locally as well is really helpful because um, we're not at the point where we like we're tracking and worrying about what is happening on master and how that's affecting it. It's much more like we need insight into if this thing that takes half an hour to run on a regular basis, I want to make changes on a branch and see what it's doing because it's too much to for a developer to be running it and then going to make a coffee every half an hour kind of thing. I've got another call to jump into as well. Um, yeah. This is really helpful. Thank you for the demos. Thank you for the discussion. I feel like we, um, to remind us of our AI, our goal is to flesh out this document um, by end of week so that we can continue using it as a benchmarking historical source of truth. Um, I think this conversation is accessible, so I'd like to make it accessible and also make the document accessible because it's really useful data. So I'm going to try and stick well. Actually, Stephen, I'm, I'm realizing I can't take AIs anymore because I dropped them. Um, Stephen or Alan or someone, could you stick the contents of this document somewhere useful on GitHub? such that other people can can find it and add to it over time, maybe when we hit our end of week deadline or something. Uh, so move this out of Google Docs and into some markdown thing. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>